In today's video, I am going to explain development of genital system, which includes common changes happening in both males and females. And we would also discuss in detail regarding male reproductive system and also the female reproductive system as well. So, genital system consists of gonads or primitive sex glands, which are testes in males and ovaries in females. Genital ducts, the duct system of gonads that carries the germ cells and external genitalia. In the early stage of the embryo, initially the embryo is indeterminate. We cannot make out whether it is male or female initially because the development of testis and ovary are similar. It is called as indifferent stage and only after this stage the development proceeds further in male or female direction into a definitive stage. So the sex of the individual is not established till 7th uh, week that is uh, till 7th week it is considered as indeterminate embryo and the development of genital system begins during the fourth week of intrauterine life. So starting with the genetic sex that is genotype XY or XX of the embryo is established at the time of fertilization but gonads do not acquire male or female morphological characteristics till uh, the embryo attains 7th week of development. Initial week that is week between 1st to 6th week of development, the gonads are structurally similar and hence this is called as indifferent stage of gonad or indeterminate embryo. So during week 7, the indifferent determinate embryo begins phenotypic sexual differentiation. By week 12, the female or male characteristics of external genitalia can be recognized. By week 20, phenotypic differentiation is complete. So, this difference of development between male and female is because of chromosomal and hormonal factors. The phenotypical differentiation is determined by SRY gene which is located on short arm of Y chromosome that is YP11 to be specific. It is located on short arm of Y that is the P arm of Y chromosome at 11th locus. The SRY gene encodes for a protein called as testis determining factor TDF. The presence of TDF leads to the development of male genital organs. As the indifferent gonad develops into testis, the Leydig and Sertoli cells differentiate to produce testosterone and Mullerian inhibiting factor that is called MIF so, this factor also produced by the Leydig cells and Sertoli cells. So, this leads to phenotypically male embryo. In the absence of testis determining factor, testosterone and Mullerian inhibiting factor and in the presence of WNT4 gene and mass, which is a master gene for the dif differentiation of female gonads. So, hence Indifferent gonad will develop into ovary and embryo will be phenotypically female. So, let's see the development of gonads in both males and females. So, the gonads develop from three sources, primordial germ cells, intermediate mesoderm and third part is coelomic epithelium covering the intermediate mesoderm. So, here it is a schematic image which is a cross section taken to show the intermediate mesoderm. So, this bulge is the intermediate mesoderm. So, if you look at the intermediate mesoderm, it forms urogenital ridge which is an elevation. So, the medial part of the urogenital ridge, this green one, will later turns to form genital ridge. So, that is about the intermediate mesoderm. Let's talk about this primordial germ cells. Primordial germ cells basically they originate from epiblast cells. So, in the initial uh, stages of embryo, uh, during bilaminar germ disc stage, we have got two types of cells, epiblast and hypoblast cells. And epiblast cells are the columnar cells and uh, which uh, later derives to form a primitive streak in its caudal part of the embryo. So, the same epiblast cells which gives rise to primitive streak will further give rise to cells called as primordial germ cells. So,
so gametes in both male and female are derived from primordial germ cells that are formed during second week of development and further they move uh, through the primitive streak during gastrulation that is during formation of trilaminar germ disk and they migrate to the wall of the yolk sac so during fourth week uh, these primordial germ cells which are present in the endodermal wall of the yolk sac they migrate along the dorsal mesentery of the hindgut by active amoeboid movements and reach the genital ridges at the beginning of fifth week and invade the genital ridges so here is the genital ridges so along the mesentery this is the mesentery this is the developing git which is derived from the yolk sac so along the endodermal wall of the yolk sac along the dorsal wall of the yolk sac the cells migrate into this genital ridge the cells migrate into the genital ridge during fifth week and they invade into the genital ridge by sixth week so in this image we can see the primordial germ cells which are traveling along the mesentery so these primordial germ cells undergo mitotic divisions and increase their number during their migration and also when they arrive into gonads they divide very fast so aberrant migration of the primordial germ cells may lead to germ cell tumors which are called as teratomas teratomas may also result from epiblast cells which are pluripotent so that was about the primordial germ cells which invade into the intermediate mesoderm that is at the genital ridges so moving on to uh, the coelomic epithelium so the gonads which are developing in the intermediate mesoderm uh, medial to the middle part of mesonephros so here are the mesonephros so let us see the further changes in this intermediate mesoderm so the first indication of development of uh, primitive gonad is seen in at about fourth week an elongated elevation called as genital ridge which appears on the medial side of mesonephric ridge so here is the medial side of the mesonephric ridge we see the genital ridge and here the red color is the mesonephric ridge so that was in the longitudinal section where we saw the genital ridge in the transverse section the genital ridge is formed by the condensation of intermediate mesoderm so we can see the green colored area the intermediate mesoderm where it is uh, containing now primordial germ cells it is lined by overlying coelomic epithelium so the cavity here which is covering this intermediate mesoderm is the coelomic epithelium which is the epithelium of intraembryonic coelom so on the arrival of germ cells into the genital ridge the cells of the surface epithelium of the genital ridge which is nothing but the coelomic epithelium it proliferates and penetrates underlying the mesenchym to form a finger like cords which are called as primitive sex cords so here is the schematic uh, representation to show the genital ridge changes so this is the genital ridge and we can see the coelomic epithelium so you can see the so in both male and female embryos uh, the primitive sex cords are connected to the surface epithelium and hence it is impossible to differentiate between the male and female gonads you can't make out the difference between the male and female gonad because these sex cords are present which are projecting from the surface epithelium so this is the surface coelomic epithelium this is the coelomic epithelium and these are the primitive sex cords and here are the blood vessels so hence the gonads at this stage are termed as indifferent gonads or indeterminate embryo 
so till this stage the development of testis and ovary is similar so next we shall move on to definitive stage so the indifferent gonads enters into the definitive stage on the development of testis in females and ovaries where the embryos will be designated as females so starting with the development of testis during in the indifferent stage there are two duct systems that is the mesonephric duct and paramesonephric duct so the testosterone produced by the leydig cells in the testis stimulates the development of mesonephric ducts to form the efferent ducts epididymis vas deferens seminal vesicles and ejaculatory ducts so we can see the mesonephric ducts forming the ductal system so because of the production of testosterone hormone by leydig cells which stimulates the development of mesonephric ducts into efferent ducts so here here are the efferent ducts which reaches the te reti testis or mediastinal testis to form epididymis so we can see here this coiled tube is the epididymis and here is the vas deferens which is also called as ductus deferens and finally it forms the ejaculatory duct so mullerian inhibiting substance which is otherwise called as anti mullerian hormone which is produced by the sertoli cells in the testis uh, causes the regression of paramesonephric ducts or mullerian ducts in males so the appendix of testis or hydatid of morgagni it is the vestigial remnant of mullerian duct attached to the upper pole of testis so usually along the upper pole of testis there would be small projection which is called as appendix of testis which is a remnant of mullerian duct in males in genetically male that is the primordial germ cells carry xy chromosomal complement under the influence of sry gene which is located on the short arm of uh, y chromosome uh, which encodes the testis determining factor and the primitive sex cords increase in length and extend deep into the central part of medulla so we can see that they extend into the deep into the central part of medulla of indifferent gonad and these are called as medullary cords of future testis and towards the hilum of the gonad the medullary cords regress and break up to form a tiny cell strands that anastomose with each other so we can see the anastomosis of tiny cell cords and these sex cords later form the seminiferous tubules the anastomosing tiny cell strands in the medulla form the reti testis in the fourth month communication is established be between the seminiferous tubules and reti testis so between the seminiferous tubules these are seminiferous tubules and these are the efferent ducts present in reti testis so we can see the communication between the seminiferous tubules and reti testis which is formed due to the anastomosing tiny cell strands and medullary cords or the sex cords of the testis which are the primordia of uh, seminiferous tubules remain solid they are like solid cord of cells until puberty and therefore the spermatogonia develop and uh, form sperms only after puberty so when the seminiferous tubules are formed by the canalization of sex cords so the seminiferous tubules contain two types of cells one is the sex cord cells the cells which are derived from the surface coelomic epithelium the other cells are primordial germ cells so the primordial germ cells form the spermatogonia and sex cord cells form the sustentacular cells of sertoli so now the mesenchyme migrates beneath the coelomic epithelium and forms a tough fibrous layer around the developing testis and separates or cuts off the sex cords from the coelomic epithelium or germinal epithelium 
so thus blocking its contribution to the formation of sex cords permanently so this tough fibrous layer covering the testis is called as tunica albiginea the mesoderm also forms mediastinum testis that is the fibrous septa which arises from the mediastinum extends towards the periphery and divides the testis into various lobules so mesoderm around the seminiferous tubules form the interstitial cells of lady so the mesoderm around the seminiferous tubules gives rise to interstitial cells of lady so by eighth week the lady cells start secreting dihydrotestosterone so that is the male hormone that stimulates the development of sexual differentiation of genital ducts from mesonephric ducts and external genitalia so the tubules of reti testis extend into the mesonephric duct where they join the mesonephric duct tubules so you can see here the tubules of reti testis they are all joining with the mesonephric duct to form efferent ductules of the so these are the efferent ductules this tiny ducts are efferent ductules so these efferent ductules will again form a duct of epididymis vas deferens so we can see here the highly coiled duct is the duct of epididymis we can see the coiled duct forming epididymis so as the testis develop they project into the coelomic cavity and are suspended from the posterior abdominal wall by a mesentery called as mesorchium let us discuss about the descent of testis so the testis develops on the posterior abdominal wall in the upper lumbar region from here it descends into the scrotum or it just uh, reaches the scrotum just after birth so stages of descent of testis if we see so testis reaches the iliac fossa during the third month of intrauterine life so we can see the testis which are present on each side in the iliac region during the third month of intrauterine life and it reaches the deep inguinal ring during at the end of the sixth month of intrauterine life so the testis would reach the deep inguinal ring at the end of the sixth month of intrauterine life and it travels through the inguinal canal so here is the inguinal so it travels through the inguinal canal at the end of uh, six that is at the end of seventh month of intrauterine life and uh, it reaches the superficial inguinal ring at the eighth month so here is a triangular superficial inguinal ring where it reaches the superficial inguinal ring at the eighth month and it reaches the scrotum at the end of ninth month so it reaches the scrotum at the end of so let's see the factors responsible for the descent of testis so the first factor is the differential growth of posterior abdominal wall so that is one factor then formation of inguinal bursa and outpouching of various layers of abdominal wall towards the scrotum and the cavity of inguinal bursa forms the inguinal canal so the inguinal bursa is formed before the testis enters into it so this is one reason the next reason is the gubernaculum testis gubernaculum is uh, the embryonic structures that begin as the undifferentiated mesenchyme and attach to the caudal end of the testis uh, to the bottom of the scrotum so here we can see the gubernaculum testis which is attached to the caudal part of the testis and to the inner wall of the scrotum so during the growth of the posterior abdominal wall there is a corresponding increase in the length of the gubernaculum so relative shortening of the gubernaculum and the testis pro progressively assumes in lower position so the upper part of the gubernaculum it degenerates and the lower part persists as gubernaculum testis which is otherwise called as scrotal ligament
so which secures the testis to the most inferior portion of the scrotum so tethering it in in its place and uh, limiting the degree to which the testis can move within the scrotum hence the gubernaculum pulls the caudal pole of the testis to the scrotum and eventually anchors the testis within the scrotum next is the increased intra abdominal pressure is one factor which also helps in the descent of testis because this increased intra abdominal pressure helps to push the testis out of the abdomen the other factors are like male sex hormones which greatly influence the descent of testis and the next factor is the processus vaginalis it is a diverticulum of the peritoneal cavity that grows uh, into the inguinal canal and scrotum so as the testis descends into the scrotum it invaginates the processus vaginalis from behind and once the testis uh, descent of the testis is completed so the part of the processus vaginalis between the testis and the deep inguinal ring it gets obliterated and the part of the processus vaginalis that covers the testis it is called as tunica vaginalis so it forms an outer covering called as tunica vaginalis which is actual continuation of peritoneal cavity embryologically the next factor is the specific neurotransmitter called as calcitonin gene related peptide is secreted by genitofemoral nerve supplying the muscle fibers of gubernaculum testis so let us talk about uh, the development of genital duct or mesonephric ducts which are otherwise called as ulfian ducts and tubules of uh, male reproductive system so mesonephric ducts they develop in the male as a part of urinary system because these ducts are critical in the formation of definitive metanephric kidney so here here is a sagittal section where we can see the mesonephric ducts and this is the ureteric bud which is also a derivative of mesonephric duct and here in this position we can see the ureteric bud is separated from the mesonephric duct because of absorption of mesonephric duct into the wall of the urinary bladder and this blue colored tube is the paramesonephric duct in males this paramesonephric ducts or mullerian ducts they regress uh, and degenerate because of anti mullerian substance or anti mullerian hormone and testosterone and other factors which i have explained so because of that these paramesonephric ducts will regress in their size whereas the mesonephric duct this mesonephric duct it forms the ductal system of male reproductive system here is the image showing partial derivatives of mesonephric ducts so mesonephric ducts we said it is proceed to form the epididymis so this is the epididymis it forms the ductus deferens this is the ductus deferens or vas deferens and it forms the seminal vesicle and ejaculatory ducts which are present near the opening of the mesonephric ducts into the uh, urethra that is the prostatic part of urethra so a few mesonephric tubules in the region of testis they form the efferent ductules so these are the efferent ductules and uh, the vestigial uh, remnants of mesonephric ducts form appendix of epididymis and mesonephric tubules called as paradidymis may found in the adult male so this completes the development of male reproductive system where we completed the development of testis and the ductal system of male reproductive system so what happens to the paramesonephric ducts or mullerian ducts in males so here are the blue colored structures which are called as paramesonephric ducts which develop in the urorectal septum so under the influence of mullerian inhibiting factor the cranial portions of paramesonephric ducts and utero vaginal primordium will regress so vestigial remnants of paramesonephric duct called as appendix testis is are present in the adult male so they get regressed to form appendix of testis in adult male so let's see the development of external genitalia 
external genitalia also begin in an indifferent stage initially it forms in the form of genital tubercle and uh, the, there are two genital swellings and two cloacal folds form in the exterior of the floor of pelvis so here is the genital tubercle so when the urorectal septum reaches the interior of the floor to separate the anal canal from the primitive urogenital sinus so we can see the urorectal septum urorectal septum when it reaches till the floor here touches here to form the perineal body so it divides the cloacal membrane into two parts that is anal urogenital membrane and posterior anal membrane so later it soon form the urinary bladder that is the urogenital sinus it forms the ur urinary bladder and cloacal folds are now called as urethral folds so in males the genital tubercle which grows as phallus so this is the phallus and as it grows it pulls the urethral folds together and uh, these folds fuses to form the shaft of the penis so these are the urethral folds then left urethral folds you can see they are fused in the midline and meanwhile the genital swellings becomes larger to form the scrotal swellings so these are the scrotal swellings to form the scrotal swellings and these are come together and fuse in the midline so you can see the line of fusion in the midline so let's see a clinical correlation associated with the development of external genitalia hypospadias occurs when the urethral folds fail to fuse completely resulting in external urethral orifice opening onto the ventral surface of the penis it generally associated with the poorly developed penis or it curves ventrally this is called, known as chordae so you can see the hypospadias the opening of the urethral meatus on the ventral side of the penis and the scrotal sac the next condition is the epispadias epispadias occurs when the external urethral orifice opens onto the dorsal sign of the penis it is generally associated with extrophy of the bladder so you can see the urethral opening opening on the dorsal side of the penis so next condition is the cryptorchidism means undescendent testis occurs when the testis fails to descend into the scrotum so descent of the testis is evident within the 3 months after birth so bilateral cryptorchidism results in the sterility and increased risk of testicular cancer So the next condition is congenital hydrocele of the testis. This is due to the small patency of processus vaginalis. So because of this patency, the peritoneal fluid can flow into the processus vaginalis, which results in the fluid-filled cyst near the testis. The next condition is the congenital inguinal hernia. It may result due to the persistent processus vaginalis. where loops of the intestine may herniate into the scrotum or labia majora and it is most common in males and is generally associated with cryptorchidism so this completes the development of male reproductive system so let's talk about the development of female reproductive system with the development of ovary so the testis and the ovary are structurally similar until 10th week of gestation and if the embryo is genetically female that is if the embryo primordial germ cells carry xx chromosomal complement and there is no y chromosome so this uh, leads to the development of female gonads so the indifferent gonad develops into ovary so the primitive sex cords containing the primordial germ cells extend into the medulla as sex cords so just as we saw here in the development of testis similarly here also primordial germ cells which are present in the primitive sex cords 
so here are the primordial germ cells which are from the primitive sex cords pgc stands for primordial germ cells and these cords dissociate into irregular cell clusters are called as reti ovary so further the irregular cell clusters it forms which is called as reti ovary so it is called reti ovary which occupy the medullary part of the ovary close to the mesonephric tubules so this is the medullary part of the ovary which is closely associated with the mesonephric tubules later they disappear and are replaced by the vascular stroma so you can see the blood vessels which are plunging forms the vascular stroma so this reti ovary is replaced by the vascular stroma later which forms the ovarian medulla so in adults it forms the ovarian medulla so the surface epithelium that is the germinal epithelium of the female gonad unlike the male gonad it continues to proliferate and in the seventh week forms the second generation of sex cords so unlike male gonad where it won't differentiate it differentiates only at the puberty but here in females they start differentiating and proliferating during their uh, intraembryonic life itself so the second generation of the sex cords containing primordial germ cells uh, do not extend into medulla hence they are called as cortical cords so they are present in the cortex called as cortical cords and here it forms the ovarian medulla in the third month these cortical cords they get fragmented to form isolated clusters so you can see the clusters of primordial germ cells and each cluster consists of a primordial germ cell in the center surrounded by a layer of coelomic epithelial cells so here is one primordial germ cell which is surrounded by a layer of coelomic epithelial cells so the primordial germ cells form the oogonia and coelomic epithelial cells form the follicular cells the resulting structure is called as primordial follicle so all the primordial follicles remain confined in the cortex of the ovary a large number of primordial germ cells are formed during fetal life but no new primordial follicles are formed after birth so further development of primordial follicles takes place after puberty so the mesoderm does not form any thick fibrous septa tunica albuginea around the ovary as in case of testis so thus the ovarian follicles are not separated from the surface epithelium of the ovary so the surface epithelium of the ovary flattens to form a single layer of cells that is continuous with the peritoneum at the hilum of the ovary so the layer of these cells is called as germinal epithelium though it does not form the germ cells anymore the mesoderm forms a thin connective tissue covering the ovary and the connective tissue stroma of the ovary and the ovary is suspended from the posterior abdominal wall by a mesentery which is called as meso ovarium so let's see the development of genital ducts in females so genital ducts in female consists of fallopian tubes uterus vagina so this is before formation so the paramesonephric ducts develops lateral to the mesonephric ducts by the vertical invagination of coelomic epithelium in the urorectal septum so cranial unfused part of the paramesonephric duct develop into uterine tubes or fallopian tubes so this is caudal fused part and here are the unfused part which forms fallopian tube or uterine tubes the caudal portions of the paramesonephric duct fuse in the midline to form uterovaginal primordium
and thereby bringing two peritoneal folds to called as broad ligament. So on each side of the uterus, we see the broad ligament because of bringing the two peritoneal folds together and thus the two paramesonephric duct fuse together in the midline to form a vertical duct which is called as uterovaginal canal. And uterovaginal primordium develops into uterus, cervix and upper one third that is a superior one third of the vagina. So it, uh, uterovaginal primordium gives rise to uterus, cervix and superior one third of vagina. Let us see the development of vagina. Upper one third of the vagina develops from the mullerian or paramesonephric ducts and lower two thirds is derived from the endoderm of urogenital sinus. So if you see the vagina, upper one third is from the paramesonephric ducts or mullerian ducts and lower two thirds is from the urogenital So, the caudal part of the Mullerian duct fuses in the midline to form uterovaginal primordium and it contributes to form upper one third of the vagina. And paramesonephric ducts project into the dorsal wall of the pelvic part of the definitive urogenital sinus and induce the formation of sinovaginal bulb. So, it, they enter and they induce the formation of sinovaginal bulbs. The endodermal cells of the sinovaginal bulbs proliferate rapidly to form a solid plate of cells which are called as vaginal plate and sinovaginal bulbs fuse to form the solid vaginal plate which canalizes and develops into inferior two thirds of vagina. So there is a controversy regarding the formation of vaginal plate. Some authorities consider that whole vaginal plate is derived from the endodermal sinovaginal bulb while the other believe that Upper part of the vaginal plate is derived from the mesodermal uterovaginal canal and lower part is derived from the endodermal sinovaginal bulbs. The central cells of the vaginal plate break down and uh, by the fifth month and the plate is completely canalized to form a lumen of vagina. The wing of the expansion of the vagina around the cervix forms the furnaces of vagina and the vagina remains separated from the phallic part by a definitive urogenital sinus by a thin plate of uh, tissue called as the hymen. So, which consists of a thin layer of vaginal cells superiorly and epithelial lining of the sinus inferiorly. Thus, the both the surfaces of the hymen is lined by the endoderm. So, the hymen is usually develops a small opening in its center during prenatal life. So next about the mesonephric ducts in females. Mesonephric ducts develop in females as a part of urinary system because uh, these ducts are critical in the formation of definitive metanephric kidney. However, they degenerate in the female after the formation of metanephric kidney and vestigial remnants of the mesonephric ducts and tubules may be found in adult female as ducts of Gartner's hypophoron and paraophora. Gartner's duct, a part of mesonephric duct, persists and lie between the two layers of broad ligament by the side of the body of the uterus and this corresponds to the vast difference in males and this duct may undergo abnormal cystic dilatations to form Gartner's cyst. Next about the hypophoron, the organ of Rosenmuller, presents vertically above the ovary in the mesoovarian. The hypophoron corresponds to the efferent ductules of testis and epididymis of males. Epi means above, oo means egg and foron means basket. So this is vertically above the ovary in the mesoovarian. So that is the reason they are called as hypophoron. The para oophoron which are called as cubic tubules, they are the small blind tubules between the ovary and the uterus and these are called para oophoron. Para means on either side or near and U means egg and foron means basket. So they are near between the ovary and the uterus like a small blind tubules which are called as cobit tubules otherwise called as paraophora. 
So let's see the development of uh, external genitalia. So female phallus forms the clitoris or glans clitoris and corpora cavernosa clitoris and uh, vestibular bulbs. So these are the from the female phallus. And uh, urogenital folds are from the labia minora forms the urogenital folds they form the labia minora and labioscratal swellings forms the labia majora and mons pubis in females. Next regarding the Mullerian age agenesis, Mullerian agenesis is caused by the embryonic underdevelopment of Mullerian duct with the resultant agenesis or atresia of vagina uterus or both. So the lower vagina agenesis and cervix agenesis and uterus and also the cervix hypoplasia and uterine tube agenesis are seen in Mullerian agenesis. Double uterus with double vagina. So here in this image you can see the two uterus. So in this condition there are two uteruses and two vaginas. You can see. And it occurs due to the complete lack of fusion of paramesonephric ducts and sinovaginal bulbs. So that is the reason formation of two uteruses and two vaginas. The next condition is double uterus with a single vagina. It is otherwise called as uterus didelphus. So here is the image of uterus didelphus. It occurs when the paramesonephric ducts fails to fuse but lie close to each other. So as a result the uterus is entirely double. You can see the two uterine cavities and the vaginal plate formed in relation to the each duct fuses with each other to form a single vagina. Next about the bicornuate uterus. In this condition there is one vagina, one cervix but the body of the uterus is duplicated. So you can see the body of the uterus is duplicated and each half of the body is called as the horn or cornu of the uterus. So one fallopian tube opens in the each horn of uterus. Unicorniate uterus. Unicorniate uterus in this condition half of the uterus is missing and it occurs when one paramesonephric duct degenerates so that only one horn of the uterus with one fallopian tube persists. The next condition is septate uterus. In this condition the two paramesonephric duct fuse with each other but the septum separating them does not disintegrate. So as a result a vertical septum separates the cavity of the uterus into two halves. So that is about the septate uterus. Next about the agenesis of uterus. It is a rare condition in which the uterus is completely absent and it occurs due to the failure of paramesonephric ducts to develop. Infantile uterus, it is a clinical condition in which the adult female possesses a sm much smaller uterus than normal. The infantile uterus resembles uh, to that of present before puberty. So the vagina and the ovaries are normal and clinically it presents as amenorrhea. Let's see some congenital anomalies with the development of vagina. Next is the agenesis of vagina. In this condition, the vagina is absent and it occurs when the urogenital sinus fails to form sinovaginal bulbs and, and it is usually associated with the absence of uterus and uterine tubes. In perforate vagina, it occurs when the endodermal cells of vaginal plate adjacent to the urogenital sinus fail to disintegrate. So this condition causes the retention of menstrual flow which is a clinical condition called as hematocolpos. Rectovaginal fistula or vesicovaginal fistula. In this conditions the vagina communicates with the rectum and the urinary bladder. And one more condition associated with the female reproductive system development anomaly is hydatid cyst of morgagni. Hydatid cyst of morgagni arises from Hydrated of Morgagni, which is the remnant of paramesonephric duct. So, hydrated cyst of Morgagni, also known as hydrated of Morgagni or Morgagni cyst, are common and appear as pedunculated and often tiny and frequently multiple cysts 
connected to the fimbria of the fallopian tubes and they appear as a specific variant of paratubal cyst so that is about the hydatids of morgagni so with this we complete the development of female reproductive system with its clinical aspects thank you